Um, can you see this? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just spend a couple of minutes uh, telling you about a paper that um, I worked on with Avi uh, that was submitted pretty recently. And what it's to do with is looking at the velocity dispersion profiles of uh, dark matter and stars as measured in hydrodynamical simulations, specifically the illustrious TNG simulation. And I was interested to see uh, what aspects of the host dark matter halo one can actually learn from looking at the motions of these stars, at least in the context of these uh, numerical simulations. Um, so in particular, we were interested in measuring these velocity dispersion profiles, and each of these panels are kind of showing the three-dimensional velocity dispersion of the dark matter in black and the stars in red um, as a function of radius. And each of these uh, panels corresponds to a halo of a different mass range. And what you notice is that there's this uh, pretty sort of generic-ish shape where the profile uh, sort of increases as a function of radius, reaches a maximum, and then falls back down. And in particular, the sort of exterior part of this profile is uh, punctuated by a kink in the velocity dispersion, which typically occurs at somewhere around uh, R200 mean, which is the radius that encloses a mean density that is 200 times uh, the background density of the universe. And this radius, this kink uh, shape is often uh, sometimes called the splashback radius of the halo, um, which essentially kind of demarcates where the um, matter content or the stellar content of the dark matter halo actually is and separates objects that belongs to the halo from the sort of overall cosmic background. And so it's typically shown in the guise of the density profile of the dark matter, but it's interesting to see that even in terms of the velocity dispersions, you can actually see these features both in the dark matter and in the stars. And these thin red curves actually show the diversity of profiles that you see around the stacked profile, the mean profile, which is shown in solid lines. And you see that there's quite a lot of diversity, and a lot of it is actually down to the differences in the assembly history of the halo at fixed mass. So one way to see this is by just taking objects of a certain mass range. So this is low mass groups. Um, and um, here now I'm showing the line of sight velocity dispersion as a function of the projected uh, distance from the halo. And in this particular mass range, you can split objects that are the most different based on their late time formation history, which is shown in the bottom row and the most different halos at fixed mass based on their early formation history. Um, and you see that the corresponding scatter in the velocity dispersion actually picks out two different radial regimes in the velocity dispersion, where objects that are most different based on their early formation history show a larger scatter in the inner portion of their profile, uh, typically within about 10% of the virial radius, whereas objects that differ most in terms of the late time history, but at the same final day mass, show more differences in the exterior part of the profile. And this is probably not unexpected because you would think that, for example, if the late time assembly history is determined by late time mergers, this will mostly add uh, material and bring things out of dynamical equilibrium on the exterior part of the profile. So this basically suggested that you might actually be able to learn something to do with the assembly history of the halo by measuring these velocity dispersion profiles. Um, and in particular for a dark matter halo, a parameter that is often used to quantify the assembly history is something called a halo concentration, um, which for uh, dark matter profiles that are defined by the so-called NFW profile is just a measure of how centrally dense the core of the dark matter halo is. And the larger the concentration, the earlier the halo forms because it's a reflection of the typical epoch uh, when this dark matter halo has actually collapsed. And so to cut a long story short, um, we, we do a variety of experiments and we find that in fact you can express um, the velocity dispersion profile of the stellar content uh, in the stars with this equation here, which is equation three. And the way we actually get to this equation is um, discussed in the preceding sections. And what's interesting to note is that the only free parameters in this equation turn out to be the halo concentration, which is this C200 value and the mass of the halo itself. 
And so what that means is that if you had a data set where you've measured the line of sight velocity dispersions and you sort of normalize it by this, um, the maximum value as we've written it here, you can actually try and fit for these two parameters and infer something about the mass of the halo and the concentration, or in other words, the assembly history of the halo, parameterized in a very simple way. And you can see, well, we know what the mass and concentration relationship is for dark matter halos in a cold dark matter cosmology. And you can basically analytically predict what this profile should look like and see how well uh, that actually fits uh, the TNG data. And that's sort of shown in this uh, figure here, where I show um, the velocity dispersion profiles across a range of halo masses in the different colors. And the stellar velocity dispersions are shown with the stars um, and the sort of solid lines for the corresponding color are the predictions of this particular model shown, which was described in equation three. And you can see to a very good, to, well, I don't know if it's very good, but to, to some extent, you, uh, you find that there's a pretty good level of agreement between the uh, measurements from the simulations themselves um, and the prediction that comes out from uh, this mass and concentration based uh, description of the line of sight velocity dispersions. And you can actually then use to use those profiles to kind of estimate where the boundary of a halo is um, simply uh, by just extrapolating this profile. And there's a particular criterion you can use to determine where the boundary is and compare that with the true results. Um, and in, in general, we find that um, you can- well, you know, so <laughs> This is supposed to be a bite and not a whole meal, sorry. Yeah. No, I sorry, this is, that's, that's the end, that's the end, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we do, sorry, we need to move on, but this is like super exciting. Um, and yeah, for, I think um, a discussion we can have with, uh, within the CFA in terms of uh, H3 survey and stuff. But today, we need to move on uh, to our guest speakers, so. Thank you, Sonak. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to to start by thanking both of our speakers for being here, and and all everyone who's here listening for being here amidst the sort of layered uh, stresses of this moment. Um, and we're really grateful for your commitment, and we're grateful for your ability to to sort of step above that and and be here. So. Um, uh, our first speaker today is Daniela Bardellas Galufi, and she is a Kalbflesch Cal Research Fellow at uh, the American Museum of Natural History. Um, before that, she did her PhD in San Diego and her undergrad degree uh, at MIT. Um, and Daniela is an expert on uh, all things tiny stars. Um, and so uh, we're going to hear today about brown dwarfs and, um, and and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan, so much for that really nice introduction. Um, let's see if I can do this correctly. All right. Can you see my screen? Cool. All right. Again, thank you so much for, for inviting me and, uh, and thank you everybody for coming today. I'm gonna to talk about stars, brown dwarfs and planets. And I hope my talk can provide some interesting distraction from the dumpster fire that is this planet right now. Um, so again, I work at the Museum of Natural History. I, um, I can go see dinosaurs on the first floor. I'm not there right now, unfortunately. And, uh, and so I thought this would be a nice introduction um, because what I wanna talk about is how the system architectures of brown dwarf and giant brown dwarf systems, star systems, and giant planets in obviously systems, um, all of those are essentially fossils, like snapshots of a past that we don't really have access to, but we see the products of the birds. So um, in the same way, I think um, same way that we see birds today, and uh, we know that there were dinosaurs, and we have found dinosaur fossils. I think that um, the the processes that led to the formation of stars, brandors, and planets that we see today um, are reflected in the configuration of the systems. So Brander formation is very likely an extension of star formation, uh, whereas planet formation is fundamentally different, even though um, even though brown dwarfs and giant planets 
their atmospheres and possibly their interiors are governed by the same kind of physics. Uh, in practice, we actually use brown dwarfs as analogs of giant planets to compare their atmospheres and their physical properties because brown dwarf data is so much nicer, <laughs> such much better signal to noise than planet data. Brown dwarfs are usually found in isolation, therefore they don't have a very bright star nearby to um, to you know to dilute all the all the data you can get from a planet. And in a way, uh, brown dwarfs are wait hold on. Um, so yes, we think that these two are formed in a similar way. And these two guys share parameter space uh, in terms of effective temperature, log G, uh, sorry, surface gravity, and their atmospheres. So in many ways, brown dwarfs are true hybrids of stars and giant planets. Um, the biggest differences, or, or rather to characterize these objects a little bit more, stars are uh, held together by thermal pressure and that counteracts the gravity that tries to collapse them inwards. And this thermal pressure is a product of the fact that stars can fuse hydrogen. Um, that is obviously the more the key element to their um, to how they work. And since they release photons through this fusion, um, they can reach hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, and if we there is a minimum mass at 80 Jupiter masses down to which you don't have the conditions in your core anymore in order to sustain hydrogen fusion. So um, that's where we find brown dwarfs. And brown dwarfs are massive enough to fuse deuterium, but not hydrogen. And deuterium is not that common. There's about 10 to minus five. The abundance of deuterium is about 10 to, 10 to minus five times the abundance of hydrogen. So um, brown dwarfs, the more massive ones, actually fuse their deuterium pretty quickly. And instead, since they run out of uh, an internal gen energy generating mechanism, they're supported by electron degeneracy pressure. And they emit light, the light and the heat that they emit are, are just left over from their initial collapse during the formation. So they cool down over time, and this is key. This is what makes them so hard to characterize. Between brown dwarfs and planets then, the nominal distinction is at 13 Jupiter masses, which is the minimum mass at which you can no longer burn deuterium, but they're not that different actually. Uh, giant planets are also held together by electron degeneracy pressure and uh, the massive, massive giant planets. Um, so it seems like a better way to classify these objects would be by formation. The classical picture of formation is that uh, stars, um, and brown dwarfs form from the gravitational collapse of a molecular cloud. Browns need a little bit of help with uh, local turbulence because that leads to high densities in order to reach low critical masses to fragment as a low mass object. Um, but they are supposed to be an extension of the same process. And the minimum mass for this process would be defined by the opacity limit, that is the smallest mass where a clump is opaque to its own radiation and therefore becomes a clump. Um, and simulations place this limit at around one to five Jupiter masses, so very low mass, which also means that this hard cut at 13 Jupiter masses is not physically motivated. Um, giant planets, on the other hand, are thought to form by core accretion in a disk necessarily, in a bottom up, sorry, that came too fast, in a bottom up, um, in a bottom up process. Um, and core accretion happens by the coagulation of solids in protoplanetary disks and until it reaches a mass of about 10 Earth masses, at which point it has enough gravity to go around the disk and collect gas in order to have an atmosphere. Um, and there are some studies that suggest that possibly core accretion can make planets as massive as five Jupiter masses. Um, and then there's this middle middle no man's land <laughs> process of disk fragmentation that can make both in principle brown dwarfs and giant planets. Um, you need to start with a very massive disk and because it's so massive and it's rotating, it becomes unstable and the unstable fragments um, can become self gravitating objects. Uh, disk mass scales with a host's mass, so more massive stars will host more massive disks that can produce more massive objects in that, in that order. 
And so these mechanisms lead to different objects that have different internal entropies at the beginning, uh, different internal heats and different compositions. Because it follows from here that um, true planets that have formed in a disk by core accretion should have a higher metallicity than their, than their host star, right? Uh, because in those cases, what we're seeing is an object that was formed from pre-processed material at a time later than when the star was formed, where the volatiles of the disk have left because the disk needs, needs to cool down in order to accrete these uh, small particles. So in principle, the core accretion process should, should yield uh, planets, companions, whatever you want to call them, um, planets probably that are more metal rich than their stars. And then in the uh, converse case, binary systems uh, should have, that are formed at the same time from the same cloud, they should have the exact same composition. And there are some uh, studies that right now are starting to test these, uh, this hypothesis. Um, for example, Eileen Gonzalez is um, now a 51 Peck fellow, but she was a grad student in our group at BDNYC. Um, she studied retrievals. She did uh, atmospheric retrievals between two, two components of a white binary system of brown dwarfs, and they both have consistent C2R ratios indicating coeval formation. Um, and also Kilan Wilcom from UCSD. She just uh, published a, a really interesting paper where um, me they managed to measure the C2O ratio of a substellar companion, uh, Kappa Andromeda B, which is a um, 12, 13 Jupiter mass object to a massive star. Uh, we don't have the, they don't have the metallicity of the star yet, but the subsolar, slightly subsolar metallicity of the companion indicates a rapid process, possibly this fragmentation. Um, for brown dwarfs in principle, we can also connect their population properties and in particular their binary fraction to a given formation mechanism. So here are some predictions from uh, different, different formation scenarios. Uh, if we eject a pre-stellar core that was being formed, don't give it enough time to let it form, then, um, then we can end up with a brown dwarf and that's predicted to be about an 8% binary fraction. From disk fragmentation, we predict about 16%. From core fragmentation as a secondary fragmentation, um, it just says that it's low. And finally, from photo, photo vibration of pre-stellar cores, they don't, there's not really a number given, but also we don't expect, we don't find brown dwarfs always around massive stars, such that the winds from the massive stars would like push all the material out and leave a naked core of a star, essentially like a proto star that became a brown dwarf. Um, we don't see that happen all the time. So we don't think that this is a, the most likely, uh, or sorry, the most um, prominent way in which we can form brown dwarfs. Um, but this is a nice idea, right? We measure the multiplicity of fraction and then we can connect back to a formation mechanism. And uh, this is what the theory predicts. Also, uh, brown dwarfs, the binary fraction of brown dwarfs follows very nicely from that of more massive stars. Um, this is another reason why we think that brown dwarf formation is a low mass, is the low mass version of the star formation process. Um, but the reality is much more complicated. Measuring binary fractions is very difficult. Um, because it depends on the technique that you're using in order to identify your binary system. And it depends, uh, because each technique is gonna be sensitive to different ranges in binary separation and in mass ratio. And it depends also on the volume that you're, on the completeness of your volume and how you chose your sample. Um, each formation mechanism leaves distinct imprints on the distributions of orbital parameters in binary systems. So this is why using a, a specific technique is also important. Um, but this also means that the population trends can be inferred from system architectures. Um, and here are a few examples of extreme systems that are sort of in the middle of some formation mechanisms or, well, they're extreme for their own right. This is uh, 2 mass 1119. It's a binary system, equal mass uh, objects. Both of them are four Jupiter masses, each one of them, and they're very closely separated. This is a 
this is very consistent with something like core fragmentation, actually. And, um, and competitive accretion leads to a mass ratio close to one. Um, it does, it is interesting though that both masses are so low that they may be very close to the minimum mass for opacity uh, fragmentation. 1207 is one of my favorite systems. Um, it's a five Jupiter mass companion to a 33 Jupiter mass brown dwarf. And the mass ratio is very low. It's very unusual for brown dwarf binaries to be this low. And it's fairly wide to think of this as a, as a planet uh, formation mechanism because a disk, as I mentioned, the more massive the star, the more massive the disk. This is a very low mass star <laughs> brown dwarf and um, its disk should also be very low mass. So this is also a bit unclear how it formed. Cap Andromeda B that I mentioned earlier has a very low mass ratio. This looks a lot more like a planet based on the low mass ratio, but it's a high mass object as well. So here we see possibly an evidence of uh, disk fragmentation producing objects as big as, as massive as 12 Jupiter masses. HR 8799, uh, it's a system of four planets, uh, possibly, and they are coplanar, which definitely very strongly suggests that they were all formed in a disk. Um, and finally, uh, 0806, which is a known and loved in the brown dwarf community. This is a white dwarf, is one of the coldest types of uh, brown dwarfs, and is associated with a white dwarf. Um, but which is interesting because the white dwarf in a past life was an A star. And that means that the mass ratio on this form must have been 0 0.004, which is unheard of for a proper binary system. This, might, this is probably a planet, but we call it a white, uh, sorry, <laughs> a white dwarf. Um, and another thing that's interesting about all these systems is that all of them, except for the, for the uh, white dwarf system, they're all young. This is how we're finding objects. They're bright and they're young. And all of these are very different systems but they possibly came for, I mean, we have to fit them in one of these few boxes of which formation mechanism they came from. Um, so we can connect the population of orbital parameters to the formation pathways as well. Here's, um, if we look at the systems as an ensemble, here's a plot from 2010 from uh, Caitlin Crider et al. And this was following the discovery of the HR 8799 planets, uh, which are shown in magenta. These boxes, uh, the x-axis, sorry, is uh, separation, y-axis is mass ratio. And these boxes were meant to indicate um, a lack of systems sort of showing these pink systems must be an extreme of the top population or an extreme of the bottom population, sort of implying like uh, at the top, these are brown dwarf systems. We know they form by gravitation fragmentation. At the bottom, we have planetary systems. We know they form by core accretion. These things are in the middle. And now with 2020, thank you, I need to rush. Um, <laughs> uh, now with tw in 2020, we have a lot more objects. These boxes are full. It's still unclear what the limit is. And the green points are the only brown dwarf masses that we know very securely from dynamical masses. Um, and we think that possibly there could be a valley between the two different populations. So uh, we won't know this until each detection, um, as I mentioned, each detection technique is sensitive to a range of separations and we won't know, we need to map our uh, selection functions very carefully, especially if we, um, uh, well, and, and both for separation and also for mass ratio. So in order to get uh, better, um, to quantify the population of binary systems, in a better way that is not dependent on separation. Um, here's a technique where you can identify binary systems based on their blended light spectra that shows peculiarities. So if you focus on the 1.6 uh, micron inset in this, uh, in this plot, there is a little dip and that corresponds to uh, methane absorption in the spectrum of a hotter object that shouldn't have methane in their atmosphere. So this is how we're identifying systems that are over, that are um, where one object is above the hydrogen burning limit and the other object is below the hydrogen burning limit. And the added, um, well, there is this separation independent. So um, 
I compiled a sample of all of these objects of all, um, all high mass brown dwarfs that were straddling the hydrogen burning limit, started at M7 all the way to L5. Um, these are the color points in the, in the color magnitude diagram and within 25 parsecs. So with the volume limited sample, I can actually get robust statistics. Within this volume limited sample, I counted how many of these spectral binaries were identified and, um, and I developed uh, simulations of the population in order to extract the true binary fraction. So assuming that I know my bias is really well for the technique that I'm using, I can recover the true binary fraction. So I'll just browse through this really quick. Um, I can talk about this later. Different, these are the input distributions. I use different uh, primary mass, different IMFs, H distributions, mass ratio distributions, and um, evolutionary models in order to derive populations of, um, of brand wars. And, um, and as you can see, they're all different. I can, I can talk about this in detail later. Um, and also estimating the selection function of the spectral binary technique. Uh, and based on that, we can, I have a very, very preliminary result suggesting that um, the population that is most consistent with the observed population came from a log normal initial mass function and a uh, uniform age distribution. This is very preliminary. Uh, there's a lot of analysis to be done with this, but it's, it's interesting to see that that is the direction in which it's going. And the binary fraction should be somewhere around nine to 25%, which we already knew. But at least with this technique, we uh, were understanding the limits of this, uh, we're understanding the selection function of this technique very well. And we have, we have measured the binary fraction in a volume limited sample which makes our, um, our, our statistics also make them robust. So in summary, um, the system architectures, the multiplicity statistics and compositions can constrain formation mechanisms for Brandwurfs and giant planets. And we have measured the true binary fraction for M7 to L5 dwarfs in a volume limited sample. And finally, that this preliminary analysis suggests a log normal IMF and a uniform age distribution. So I am sorry I had to rush through it and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank, thank you, you Daniela. This is really nice. Uh, and you thank actually you. managed to finish yes. like a, a minute ahead of time. <laughs> I got a little afraid um, when I heard the ring. <laughs> um, Okay, maybe then, like we, uh, we yeah, can sorry. immediately go back to the like this um, interesting tidbits about the, the constraints you get on the on the IMF. Um, so I guess my first question is, uh, how well can you distinguish? You said like you you prefer a log normal solution, but um, mm -hmm. I think it, at least in terms of context of stars, it looks like that. Uh, log normal is like pretty similar to the broken parallel. So can you really distinguish between uh, like Krupa and, and Chabrier? Uh, no, quite. Uh, that is a really good question. So I think that um, when I did this analysis, uh, let me go back a few slides if I can. The, the input distributions um, are use three different IMFs: the Chabrier IMF that's log normal, the Krupa IMF that is um, that is a broken IMF, and uh, but sorry, two broken power laws, and the Kirkpatrick empirically derived IMF that is also a um, a power law, but with a slightly steeper, so less steep um, exponent, and. I did a, so between these and the different age distributions and the different mass ratio distributions and then the different evolutionary models, I ended up with 72 populations of binaries each. And, um, and from those, I, I found these, uh, these simulated populations and I compare the distribution of spectral types, of primary spectral types from the simulations to the observed primary spectral types, because that's what I had for my observed sample. Um, I did model selection with a KS test. And 
and found that the, there were six sensors that were indistinguishable and they were all log normal IMF and an H distribution that went from, from zero to 10 giga years. Because I also tried an H distribution that was like from zero to seven giga years, thinking that since we live in a plane, most things are younger. Mm-hmm. But, um, but that seemed to be the most consistent one. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, okay, that's a, a great follow-up to, um, <laughs> to what I was wondering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Next, um, yeah, it, like how much um, flexibility was there in the age models? Uh, or I guess in, a, in another way of asking, like how strong are those constraints that it is um, a uniform like age distribution? Okay, um, so here the different. Yes. So I, I can't show my mouse, but if you see on the top right corner that mm-hmm. those are the different age distributions they use, um, the and you can see how the uniform ten goes all the way to ten giga years, uniform seven goes to seven. The Omer distribution um, assumes a star formation rate that was higher in the past, and then the Rujakaparan distribution assumes a a high star formation rate that happened very far away in the past, like a Z of uh, a redshift mm-hmm. of one or two, I can't remember. Um, so you see the the mean age of the mean of the ages age distributions um, determine. Maybe I can show you with this better. If you look at the top left, that's the primary spectral type distributions, and they're very different because round our school over time. Mm-hmm. When, we, when we assume a population and we give them all masses and then we give them all ages and then let them evolve, uh, this is a mixed population of very, very low mass stars that are not gonna change their spectral type and their temperature that much because they are stars. And then a big population of brown dwarfs that will actually cool over time. So it's, there's a lot of detailed analysis that can go into describing these distributions. Um, but yes, to answer your question of the age distribution, how sure I am of the uniform 10, um, all I know at this point, because analysis is still ongoing, is that that is, that is the one that I couldn't reject with the, <laughs> with the chaos test. It's the, it's the least rejectable one. <laughs> That's what I know. Uh, yeah, this like this figure really shows like kind of the, the power of this uh, uh, of this space and kind of uh, modeling the, the whole set of populations. And um, so I'll turn now to the questions from um, the audience. And I have a question about this um, kind of population approach, saying that some of the architectures must have been affected by gravitational interactions among objects or uh, through the expulsion of some objects and migration of others. Uh, Mm -hmm. So his question is, how do you account for this complication? I haven't. I, yes, I haven't accounted for that complication because I'm starting at the point, I'm starting on the initial mass function point. So if there were, Two parts to your answer, Avi. Uh, one, one part is that I haven't accounted for that because I am started at the initial mass function point, um, which already assumes that there were processes changing the, the masses of clumps into the final product that is self-gravitating. So I'm starting at that point. So I have no knowledge of what happened before. You know, if there were nearby objects accreting mass that were in your reservoir and then you ended up with low mass or something like that, that's that should be accounted for in the initial mass function. And second, that system architecture wise, um, I'm considering here objects because I'm trying to recover the true binary fraction from the spectral binary technique. Then I have turned all of these binary systems that I created on this population into spectral binaries. The piece that was missing here when I explained this is that um, I made the primary and the secondary. Uh, I made, uh, I drew uh, primary masses from the IMF, ages from this age distribution, a mass ratio from a mass ratio distribution, and then that's how I got the secondary masses. Um, based on, and then those two masses with the ages were evolved to today's, um, you know, depending on the age, they are evolved to a certain temperature, and based on those temperatures that are translated to spectral types, 
I am able to draw real spectra from a library and then add those two together, scale into 10 parsecs, pretend that it's a binary system that is unresolved, and then test it on my technique and then see if my technique can recover that binary, that true uh, spectral binary as such. And so by, by doing that, what I'm, what I'm doing is this part, um, trying to understand what is the selection function of the binary technique, of, of the spectral binary technique. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as long as um, uh, what your starting point incorporates the, the fact that there were expulsions and some migrations. So um, I guess we don't know much about it, but um, you can see if the mapping of your initial conditions to what we observe is, is matching the data. That, that's what you're telling me. So, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, I think with a, sorry, with the system architectures part, um, because I'm using the spectral binary technique, it is independent of separation, uh, but also because I'm using a volume limited sample for the observed population, then I am sensitive to binary separations out to 12.5 uh, AUs for these systems because of the width of the slit that I use in order to observe the spectrum. And that is, that is beyond the peak of the separation distribution of brown dwarf binaries. So I should be taking most of the, of the systems that are possibly formed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and maybe just as a, as a close up, so Morgan asks about the implications for the formation mechanisms. Um, so since you're deriving that many of these distributions are continuous, um, what does this mean for the formation mechanisms overlapping in phase space? And Morgan, if like any of you, feel free to elaborate. Um, Morgan, let me see if I understood your question. So are you asking about... Um... I guess I'm interested in the idea mm -hmm. that like, it seems because the eventual combined distribution from all these processes mm -hmm. seems to be kind of continuous, does that mean that multiple processes can form objects with similar properties? Or That's how do we... True. <laughs> hmm, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. In this simulations, I, my minimum mass is around 0.01. Um, okay. These are these lines are kernel uh, density estimates, so they're not they're nice and smooth, but at the edges they're not reliable. <laughs> and um, and based on the, I mean, based on the code that I'm working with, I can make masses down to um, down to one Jupiter mass, I think, and that is also a, reg a regime where, where core accretion can easily make objects. And this fragmentation can also make objects like that. But all of the systems that I have simulated here are, because they're coming from this, um, from this different stellar brown dwarf IMFs, then I am assuming for all of them that they're being formed as a, like from gravitational fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm also assuming that the secondary mass distribution is uh, dependent on the first, because I am not drawing the secondaries from the first, from the IMF, I'm drawing the secondaries from a mass ratio distribution. So that could be an interesting experiment to do as well. It's really right. fascinating, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize that I rushed on the end. <laughs> no, <laughs> this like is that. really wonderful. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is yes, very interesting, and we don't really get to hear much about brown uh, dwarfs very often. So thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, they're I guess like the un unpopular middle. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker, Evan Bauer, who is um, uh, a. Um, ITC member and a CFA postdoctoral fellow um, starting this, this year. Um, he is an expert on stellar and binary evolution and is gonna talk to us today about um, white dwarfs and sub dwarfs. And um, Evan did his PhD at UC Santa Barbara and um, 
a postdoc um, uh, at KITP um, before before coming uh, here, at least virtually. Um, <laughs> so we're delighted to have you um, today, and thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Morgan. I'm uh, really happy to be here, and actually, here I really am in. I'm in P216 now. Okay, I thought so, but I didn't want to say in case I was wrong. Yeah. So uh, yeah, great to be here. I'm uh, glad to have a chance to introduce myself uh, more broadly to the ITC. So uh, for this talk, it's a little less digging into a really specific science pro problem and more an attempt to uh, give a broad overview of some of the science that I've uh, been doing and uh, plans for what I intend to do over the next few years uh, while I'm here. Uh, so hopefully that just gives everyone uh, a better idea of, of what I do and maybe you know, opportunities to collaborate or uh, think about new ideas. Um, so uh, I'm a theorist or maybe a computationalist. I work on uh, stellar evolution models, especially uh, subdwarfs and white dwarfs. I often use uh, the code MESA. Every once in a while I end up doing a development of MESA when I need new features for the, the science that I'm working on. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, the many topics involving runaway stars and supernovae um, that I'm interested in with these kinds of stars. Um, and I guess I should also mention, so uh, my collaborators on, on this particular work uh, I've worked a lot with Chris White and Matt Coleman, uh, especially when it comes to the, the hydro parts of models. They're uh, both Athena++ experts, uh, and so they've done a lot of really helpful work in uh, doing hydrodynamic models uh, involving supernovae. Abby Polin is a postdoc now at uh, Carnegie and Caltech. Uh, she does a lot of uh, detonation models for thermonuclear supernovae. Uh, and of course, Lars Bildstein was my PhD advisor at UCSB. Um, oh, there we go. OK, uh, before I actually get into runaways, I did want to quickly mention one other topic uh, that I've done some work on that I'm very interested in. That's uh, white dwarf pollution. So uh, white dwarfs uh, have a lot of really interesting things going on at their surfaces. It turns out a lot of them uh, show signatures of accretion of planetesimals that somehow get scattered close to the white dwarfs and then uh, tidally disrupted and accreted onto white dwarf surfaces. Um, and the, the physics of that problem is really interesting. I won't really get into it that much today, uh, but I wanted to mention that I work on it. Uh, I think the most interesting aspect to me is when you have a, a stably stratified uh, stellar structure, but you end up with kind of inverted composition, uh, you, you get interesting physics. So when you have heavy elements sitting on top of light elements, uh, where white dwarfs tend to want to stratify the other way, of course, because of their strong gravity, uh, there's lots of interesting physics to do there. Um, and you can see actually a very easy terrestrial analog is if you put uh, warm salt water on top of uh, cold fresh water, you get uh, the same kinds of instabilities. Um, and believe it or not, this will relate to uh, runaway stars. I'll try to tie that back in at the end. Um, but getting around to runaway stars, I first want to start by kind of defining what I'm really referring to, because uh, the term runaway gets used in a lot of different contexts uh, for uh, stellar astrophysics. So when I say runaway, I really mean uh, pretty fast runaways. Some people would characterize these as hyper runaways, um, stars moving more than uh, about 500 kilometers per second. In other words, uh, unbound from the galaxy, uh, leaving the galaxy at least uh, in our neighborhood within the uh, within a kiloparsec or two of, of where the sun sits. Um, and I want to be careful uh, not to use the term hypervelocity star, uh, especially with Warren Brown in the audience. Um, that often has connotations of stars coming from the galactic center uh, that uh, are moving faster than 1,000 kilometers per second, probably associated with the Hills mechanism and the, the supermassive black hole at the galactic center. Um, so. I'm not talking about uh, that sort of mechanism, but uh, I am talking about stars that move almost that fast, or uh, in some cases, just as fast as uh, we, what you might have read about in the sort of hypervelocity star um, literature. Uh, but I'm going to mostly uh, stick to the term runaway for these kinds of stars. Uh, and the reason uh, I'm interested in them is I, I think because there are now classes of stars uh, that with Gaia DR2 have been discovered that are moving at these kind of fast velocities, leaving the galaxy 500 up to even 3000 kilometers per second. Um, their trajectories don't point anywhere near the galactic center. So the Hills mechanism is out unless you believe there are supermassive black holes uh, floating around everywhere. Um, really what 
has to produce these kinds of stars is uh, binary systems in which you have compact binaries, fast orbital velocities, uh, some sort of supernova explosion, thermonuclear explosion has to occur uh, to destroy one of the stars and liberate the other one or kick the other one into a, a high velocity trajectory. Um, and so just in the last couple of years, a, a couple distinct classes, I think I would pretty strongly argue that there are multiple classes of these uh, new types of stars have been discovered thanks to uh, data from Gaia. Uh, one of these is uh, so-called D6, uh, that's named after a, a mechanism. I think uh, James Yashuan did a lot of work on this. Ken Shen uh, led the particular paper discovering uh, these. So they name D6 for their uh, poetic, dynamically driven double degenerate double detonation type 1a supernova scenario. Um, the argument is that this is a double white dwarf system that uh, experiences a particular detonation mechanism and sends uh, one of the stars, the one that doesn't explode off at a very high velocity. Um, and then there's another class of stars that also sort of have some distinctive features uh, that seem to be produced by th thermonuclear supernovae and binaries. Uh, the name that we've kind of ended up at as a community is LP40, just naming them after uh, the first type of star discovered in this class. These are moving a little slower. Um, they're moving sort of in the 500 to 800 kilometer per second uh, range. So they're probably not produced by double white dwarf systems, but they uh, do need something uh, pretty dramatic to happen in a stellar binary system uh, to produce them. Uh, and so uh, just quick overview, I uh, found these really nice uh, illustrations from the Chandra website. Uh, the idea here is you have a compact binary, again, uh, that will spiral together and uh, mass transfer will occur in some way that will cause a thermonuclear supernova. Uh, I'm gonna stick to being pretty agnostic about uh, the sort of observational classes. So uh, generally, I mean, uh, a detonation in a white dwarf is a th thermonuclear supernova. I'm not going to be too concerned if it's necessarily, you know, a type 1a, uh, a, a classic normal type 1a, or maybe a peculiar 1a. Uh, and then, of course, once that star blows up, it uh, liberates the other companion star, uh, maybe hits it and kicks it as well. Uh, and that's what is producing these hypervelocity stars, we think. Um, okay, one of the most interesting questions that immediately came out when these uh, classes of stars were discovered actually was not really expected. They didn't select them based on where they sat in the HR diagram. They mostly went looking for uh, high velocities from proper motion data in Gaia. Um, but they ended up kind of sitting in a consistent place in the HR diagram. So here's the Gaia HR diagram. Right here is the, the uh, main sequence. Uh, white dwarfs are all the way down here, much more compact. Uh, and these classes of stars are kind of more generally in the subdwarf regime, meaning they're you know, maybe up to a few tenths of a solar radius, uh, definitely not as, as uh, puffy as a main sequence star, not as compact as uh, a white dwarf. Uh, and that's actually a big problem for the velocities that they found, um, because the velocity requires uh, binary orbits that are very, very compact. Uh, for, the, for the star to actually sit within, uh, fit within that binary system, it has to have a radius uh, much closer to where uh, white dwarfs would sit uh, to produce the orbital velocities that are observed with Gaia proper motion data. Uh, and so the first physics problem, uh, I think from a theoretical perspective, is to understand how you get uh, from the compact state that they must have been in when the thermonuclear explosion occurred to the currently observed state where we think it's probably um, hundreds of thousands or maybe a few million years later uh, while these stars are on their way out of the galaxy where we're observing them now. Um, so just to quantify that a little more, it's actually pretty straightforward using the Roche geometry to, to write down the requirement of what the radius of the star has to be as a function of its orbital velocity. Um, so you see for every thousand of kilometers per second of orbital velocity that you want to produce, you need to be uh, smaller than a few hundredths of a solar radius. Um, and the most obvious piece of physics to look at is, can the shock from the supernova ejecta have a large impact on the star? And uh, one way to maybe write down a quick estimate uh, for answering that question is, what's the ram pressure in the shock uh, for you know, supernova ejecta moving at 10,000 kilometers per second versus sort of the average pressure uh, in the companion star. And indeed, that's 
that ratio is pretty high. And so it does seem, you, seem like you could uh, excite a shock that would have a, a pretty large impact on the structure of the star. So um, one of the kinds of projects I've worked on recently is uh, looking at uh, pursuing that in more detail with some hydrodynamical models. Uh, so we started with uh, a family of models largely motivated by uh, uh, compact systems uh, involving a white dwarf and a sub dwarf. Um, so this is kind of my, my crude uh, illustration, uh, crucially drawn to scale. So this larger star would be a sub dwarf donor star about half a solar mass, uh, helium hot sub dwarf, um, burning helium in its core. Uh, over here on the left would be uh, a white dwarf that's about three quarters of a solar mass. Uh, and these, these correspond to actually observed systems that we've seen in our galaxy. Uh, give the telephone number of the most famous one up here. Uh, and we think we know how to evolve that forward in time into a configuration that is very likely to produce some sort of thermonuclear detonation. Um, because it's a helium uh, subdwarf star, it will stably transfer about 0.2 solar masses of helium from the subdwarf onto the white dwarf. That's very likely to detonate and cause a detonation that transitions into the core of the white dwarf and cause a thermonuclear supernova. Uh, at, the, at this moment, um, you can see the supernova is going to occur, occur very close by to the donor star, uh, and the donor star has an orbital velocity of 700 kilometers per second for this particular model. Um, and so working with Chris White, who's uh, an expert in Athena++, this is a, a fairly straightforward um, in, in the sense of sort of van vanilla ideal 3D hydrodynamics with soft gravity. Um, we mapped from our MESA models of the binary to uh, Athena, where we put the donor star, the, the remnant of the helium subdwarf, uh, here in the Athena grid. And what you're going to see when I play this movie is ejecta coming from just off the grid to the left uh, and slamming into that uh, donor star. And you see uh, a shock traverses through the star. Uh, some material is stripped away. Uh, the star is kicked a little bit. Uh, this is, by the way, in the frame of the... Uh, initial orbit of the donor star. So you don't see any of its orbital velocity here, but you do see some of a, a perpendicular kick velocity away from where the supernova occurred. Um, uh, so this particular model uh, is somewhat affected by the shock. It's not very strongly affected, uh, but this actually we think is really a family of possible explosions with uh, explosion energies on the order of 10 to the 51 ergs um, and donor masses that range from sort of 0.2 to maybe 0.35 solar masses. So uh, if we crank this up to a, a different model with a little bit more explosion energy and a, a system that has actually donated more helium, so it's been shaved down uh, to about 0.2 solar masses, uh, actually 0.25 before the explosion occurs, it has a higher orbital velocity of 900 kilometers per second. Uh, this system, when it gets hit uh, by the supernova shock, uh, really is stripped of a lot of mass. It loses almost half of its mass. And the strong shock that travels through the interior um, deposits a lot of entropy, uh, heating the interior material and, uh, and really rearranging the structure of the star. Uh, so then we also developed a procedure to map uh, these kinds of models back into MESA to do long-term stellar evolution again, um, using these entropy profiles from this family of explosions. Uh, so we published a paper about this last year uh, and because I don't think I have a whole lot of time left. I'll probably go through this pretty quickly. But um, the upshot is for this class of models, we found that the subdwarf donor stars could be pretty strongly impacted by the shock. Um, it actually takes some time for the, the shock heating to sort of develop into something that uh, adjusts the star over thermal timescales and causes it to inflate. But we think on the timescales of a few million years where we actually observe these stars, um, they will be. Uh, pretty significantly inflated relative to where they were uh, at the moment of explosion. Uh, here's what they look like on the air diagram. Great, thanks. Uh, perfect timing. So uh, this is one of those classes of stars that we think probably the, the lower velocity class, the LP40 stars, uh, probably nicely corresponds to this scenario involving subdwarf donors that are compact enough to get up to uh, maybe eight or 900 kilometers per second, uh, but not compact enough to get up to the thousands of kilometers per second. Um, so to explain the second class of high velocity stars that has been observed, uh, you really need double white dwarf systems. And so 
uh, we're in the process of working to extend some of that modeling to uh, do white dwarfs uh, interacting with supernova ejecta, uh, which is a harder problem that actually involves um, a lot of Athena development to have an equation of state suitable uh, for white dwarfs. So this is a very preliminary model uh, qualitatively. We'll show you the kinds of things we're working on. Um, I think we have a long way to go here still, but this is something that Matt Coleman ran with some uh, new equation of state capabilities that he's uh, developed for Athena. Um, and you can see you know, qualitatively a similar model where you have a white dwarf uh, getting hit by supernova ejecta from an, a nearby supernova. I think the most fun thing about this movie is uh, the time scale is different because this is uh, so much more of a compact system uh, that the, the time you'll notice is actually running in real time, which corresponds to simulation time as well. Um, so it turns out that you know, the time scale for this whole process in a compact white dwarf system really is a few minutes. <laughs> Uh, so you can watch the watch the video in real time. Uh, it turns out for this particular model, it, the shock does not affect the white dwarf nearly as strongly. So um, in attempting to explain the observed structure of these uh, really high velocity uh, D6 oh, white dwarf, uh, what we think were once white dwarfs, uh, the shock is not enough to explain it. And that's really because when I wrote down that sort of simple little formula, I had assumed uh, more or less an ideal gas equation of state, the pressure in the center of a white dwarf is dominated by degeneracy pressure and is much higher. And so the ram pressure of the shock is not enough uh, to really significantly perturb it. So for this uh, set of models so far, it looks like pure hydrodynamics is not enough to explain uh, what is going to cause this white dwarf to end up significantly inflated into the state that we see for the observed objects today. Uh, so there's a lot more work that we think needs to be done to figure out what kind of um, what kind of explanations are left uh, for those objects. Um, and then switching gears just a little bit. So this is going back to one of the subdwarf models, uh, plotting it in, uh, in a slightly different color scale to show you the composition of that uh, model. So if you track the composition of what is uh, supernova ejecta in red and what is the donor star or material being stripped away from the donor star in blue, um, this is kind of the beginning step of what we want to do to understand uh, what ends up being the composition of the final object. Um, and so I'm, I'm working with, uh, again, Matt Coleman and Chris White and also uh, Abby Poland to really understand what kind of supernova ejecta profiles are the right things to use here to try to start calculating uh, the mixing that will occur kind of at the end of this shock. There should be some lower velocity tail of material from the supernova that gets accreted onto the final bound remnant, even after you strip away a lot of material from the initial surface. Um, and that's important because these classes of stars, uh, they definitely show signs of, uh, you might call it pollution. Um, here's a, a figure from uh, Ken Shen's paper a couple of years ago, comparing low resolution spectrum of the, the high velocity uh, runaway D6 candidates um, he's comparing, that's the black low res specter down here, uh, comparing actually to polluted white dwarfs showing uh, in some sense, they look like just heavily extra polluted white dwarfs. Um, there's clearly gonna be a lot of information in the spectra to mine out uh, that hasn't been done yet, but we'd like to understand how they get to that uh, state. Uh, for the other class, the LP40 stars, um, actually some of the composition analysis has been done. They got high resolution spectra and spent uh, a, quite a lot of effort trying to understand what is the composition of these objects? Uh, and they got a really strange answer, actually. Um, so this figure is a little bit uh, much to walk through maybe in a few minutes, but uh, I would focus on the three bars on the left here, the actual observed objects for what their model came out saying the, the surface composition is dominated by. Um, and it's actually mostly neon and oxygen, uh, absolutely no hydrogen, really no sign of helium even. Uh, and so there's a lot of, uh, I think, speculation out there still about how you can produce this structure. Uh, and I just want to point out, you, you really have to do a lot of stellar evolution modeling to get from the moment of some particular supernova explosion model to uh, what we would observe now, because uh, presumably if you have heavy elements at the surface, there's going to be a lot of rearranging for sedimentation. You know, these are compact objects. They have uh, fairly strong surface gravities. And so there's a lot of different mixing physics that you have to account for. 
uh, to understand what are we observing? How do we map that from you know, an initial supernova explosion model into something that will be observed a few million years later? Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'll close by uh, trying to wrap back around to, in some ways, I do think it's, it's similar physical modeling to be done that has not yet been done uh, to polluted white dwarfs, uh, but just under much more extreme conditions. Um, when you have an atmosphere that's actually dominated by these heavy, heavy elements rather than just having uh, traces um, that are being observed. Um, but I also think that the, the prospects for uh, rewards from this work could be even greater um, if you care about supernovae especially, because I think they could tell us a lot about um, the supernova explosion mechanism that is producing these uh, weird kinds of stars. So yeah, I think I should wrap up there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Evan. It's uh, definitely a, a rich area um, that has many connections to uh, research interests at the IPC as well. And um, to kick us off, Avi asks if you have considered the impact of supernova inject on floating planets. Hmm. Um, I have not personally considered that effect. Uh, I think I once saw, <laughs> I ran across an old nature paper by Sterling Colgate about that. So that might be the place to start, but I, yeah, I haven't <laughs> looked at that particular topic. Do you have any intuition as to what would happen? I guess Daniela uh, asked uh, her, her speaker, um, kind of up to what separation would a planet or companion be affected by the supernova with, uh, by this blast and would it push the object closer to the uh, white dwarf or further away from it? Uh, yeah, well, one thing we, we do see that there's a kick um, uh, away from, mm -hmm. from where the white dwarf sits. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in general, planets are probably going to be further away and experience uh, less of a shock, right? I mean, this, these binary stars are probably about as, as close as, can, as an object can be. Um, and so uh, what that means, that there's actually, um, if you talk about uh, filling the Roche lobe before you have to start mm -hmm. going and accreting onto the, um, onto the white dwarf companion, uh, that tends to happen at a fairly uh, constant solid angle fraction, uh, meaning you're presenting a constant cross section to the supernova, whether you move further, you know, if you take a main sequence star filling its Roche lobe much further away, it will actually be sort of similarly impacted uh, or mm -hmm. kicked by the ejecta because it, it presents the same overall cross section. Um, so then extending that to planets, I think you would only see things uh, generally further away and less, less impacted. Okay. okay, so it looks like we have a couple of uh, raised hands. So maybe John Raymond, um, go ahead. Hi. Um, there is one uh, D6 star that's associated with a 100,000-year-old supernova remnant. Is 100,000 years long enough for, the, for any uh, supernova ejecta that end up on the surface of the runaway white dwarf to gravitationally settle or not? Uh, yeah, I think that is definitely the probably the right time scale um, for things, for interesting things to to happen. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's long enough because these objects are fairly compact um, that, you know, if, so if it were a white dwarf, actually sinking time scales can be as short as uh, uh, just a few years. Um, because they're somewhat puffier, I think the, the overall settling time scale is maybe hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, but then there's also probably important fluid instabilities like thermohaline mixing that will operate on even shorter time scales to rearrange things. Okay, we have one more question for Wolfgang Kersendorf. Hi, um, thank you very much for the talk and, and, and Selma invited me to this thing. I'm, I'm, I'm coming in from, from Michigan State University and, and I've been very interested obviously in surviving companions. Uh, most of my career I've, I've looked for surviving companions 1A remnants and now you've uh, sort of made a new candidate or new new proposed um, uh, sort of surviving companion. And I'm wondering how deep do we need to search 
to um, find them? And like, what are your faintest model? If you would sort of go in and say like, you know, we would go to this depth and I saw 10,000 uh, Kelvin and roughly a solar luminosity pop up. Is that the faintest you get for these things or? Um, yeah, I guess I can scroll back to, you know, this particular uh, family of models. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, one thing I definitely skipped over here is uh, I, there are different tracks for, you know, a, a different, this is kind of a set of models with different explosion energies and different amounts of impact by the ejecta. The black X here marks where on the track it uh, has the lifetime since the explosion has been 10 million years. Um, so for some of them, yeah, you do end up with, with fainter objects that never really uh, inflate quite as much. Uh, and they, they sort of start cooling down um, on time scales of roughly 10 million years. I think there is an upper limit of these kinds of objects tend to uh, leave the galaxy within a few tens of millions of years, right? That's, I mean, the you know, remnants that I'm looking at are, are like 1006, like a thousand years old or, or, or 2000 years old. So I, I mean, the mm. like what, yeah. what temperatures would we look, what temperatures and luminosities would we be looking there? So 10 million years is not something where we can see supernova remnants. Supernova yeah, remnants. so that's actually, that's, I see, yeah, you're really talking about the trying to associate stars with the remnants. Um, that's right, yeah. That's short enough uh, that I think that would be long before uh, the shock ends up really causing the star to be inflated. Uh, and so it would be pretty low luminosity. Um, so in this figure, I, the what's happening is there's a thermal wave. Uh, there was entropy deposited uh, deeper in the core of the star that takes time before it can uh, diffuse outward and then re rearrange the structure of the star. And depending on the model, uh, you know, you see here's, there's a set of models where that happens within a few thousand years. And there's a set of models where it takes up to a, a few million years. Um, so we did do some work on estimating that, but yeah, I think uh, actually in your case, waiting longer would be the, the best chance of seeing brighter objects. I unfortunately don't have 10 million years. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't maybe I don't know how long. Yeah, older supernova remnants. I think you know things on the order of a thousand years. There are some families of models where that thermal wave can emerge. Yeah, I guess that's the way to frame it. Um, just as a final question, Evan, do you think there will be new types of runaway stars uh, found in, in Gaia? Like, do your models theoretically predict some uh, sometimes that haven't been observed yet? Uh, well, I think uh, the, the thing that I'm really most excited about is getting more analysis of the stars that have been observed. Um, mm -hmm. So because they have such complicated spectra, it's pretty hard to understand. Um, I, I, yeah, I think there's there's a lot there's just a lot more information to be gleaned. I think with coming uh, Gaia data releases, we probably will start to get uh, better constraints on exactly what the um, orbital parameters of those systems are. Uh, I can't remember if there's an estimate that we'll see many more in the very near future, but. Uh, but we might. I think we haven't really searched exhaustively for these kinds of stars. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, looking forward to continuing this conversation. Uh, as we heard, Evan is here uh, coming into the CFA. So uh, please feel free to reach out. And if there are more questions, yeah, there's also a Slack channel where we can continue the discussion. Yeah, I'll definitely hang out on Slack for the next 10, 20 minutes. <laughs> thank you to thank both you. our speakers. And thank you all for coming. And, and being so engaged today and like for more than an hour. So thank you all so much. Bye bye. See you next week. <laughs> bye. Thank you again, Daniela. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. No. Oh, yeah, thank you. I, I just I always say until the end, sometimes just for discussion. <laughs> It's just, I don't know. No. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, I, I'm kind of 
searching back and forth. I, I should probably write it up uh, on Slack so there's just like a record of this question. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. But, thank you so much for inviting me. No, thank and, you. Um, We're really grateful. Uh, thank you. Can I, uh, can I get the link to the talk at some point? Yes. Later. We'll yes. Yeah, we'll okay. definitely send it along. It'll um, be not immediately, but like that's in a okay. Day that's or it's actually like pretty that. quick. I think Mark yeah. has it like okay. within a day. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Uh, well, thank so you so much. And yeah, Good I think it, it were like I know it was rushed, but I think it would. Okay, I guess we are. We can 